Welcome everybody to the start of a new Let's Play series. We're going to be taking a look at Gordian Quest this time. Now this is a fantasy strategy roguelite game developed and published by Mixed Realm Studios. And by the way, my name is Gracian. Welcome to my channel. Welcome to this new series. And I hope you're going to have a lot of fun watching just as much as I will playing it. And you know, if you like the game, pick it up. It's still in early access, but there's a lot of development going on and what's in the game already is very solid. And as I mentioned, it is a roguelite game. Now, what does that mean? In this case, it means that, like a lot of roguelite games, it is a deck building game. You do take a team of three heroes in, and there are a, a good number of heroes right now. You can actually see them all on this main screen here. I don't know if there are any more planned, but the ones that there are right now give a lot of build variety and a lot of fun. And they're all very distinct as well. Like some roguelite games, there is an actual grid in combat, so it does add a tactical component that involves moving your units around, placing minions or traps, or using obstacles or trying to avoid them. So in this quest, there is a curse that has befallen the land and caused a lot of chaos to uh, ensue, um, sort of corrupting the land. There's undead rising in one place, and there's you know thugs and bandits over here, and um, it's, it's a fairly standard fantasy setting, but I think they did a really good job of making it feel very fun and making the characters and the, the models distinct and interesting. So let's start off by taking a look at just some of the options. Um, in the options for display, there's some basic resolution, um, display mode, frame rate. There is a colorblind mode. I'm not 100% sure what it changes, but I keep this on because I am colorblind. There is a prologue that will, uh, if you want to play and watch the introduction video, I'm not going to go ahead and do that at this time. There is a codex that lets you go through and look at all the items and skills and things that you've ever found. Now, as you can see, this game uses um, items uh, like equipment for your heroes. And I did mention this in my channel update video. I said that there's there's a lot of systems going on in this game. And in some ways, that's really fun. And in some ways, it's, it's kind of a lot. I mean, this is... This is a lot. This is a lot of stuff. And this is just the stuff that I've, you know, found. Uh, if you collected items only. So, 164 of 293 cards discovered. That's, uh, that's a lot. We can also take a look at artifacts. Artifacts are really powerful items that change the way your runs will play. It gives you really powerful options. And you can take a look at the skills. You know, you can go to, say the sword hand guide, just your basic fighter guide, you can see, you know, I've unlocked 46 of the 69 cards that are available for him. Some characters have a lot more than that. Where is the druid? The druid has 85, for instance, so she has a lot more cards. This studio is very devoted to frequent patching. You can see there is a patch on July 17th, July 16th, July 15th, July 14th, July 13th. They, they put out a patch almost every day um and you can see they're like they're not just for like one thing there's like fixes a lot of bug fixes and then some um balancing things and some additions and stuff like that they did come out with a big overhaul of how the game was played back in june i think it was on june 24th or something um this game is currently you know i will warn you as of the time of recording this this game is in a, a bit of a state of flux there they changed some fundamental ways that some of the systems in the game work, and there's been a bit of um, discourse about it in the community about whether these changes are good or not. So, um, fortunately, the publisher, the developer, sorry, is um, is quite receptive to these complaints and issues, and they're they've been monitoring those on like the Steam pages and stuff, and and letting us know that they're they're listening and they're seeing if they can if they can change things uh, in a way that everyone will be happy with. So. Let's go ahead and, and get on into new game and I'll show you how everything works. And by the way, this will be uh, probably an episode zero where we won't really do a lot of gameplay. We'll probably just talk about the systems and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's head on over into new game. We'll take a look at what's going on. There's a campaign mode. This is a story-based linear adventure. There's a little bit of randomness in it, but most things are sort of set in stone. You'll get access to most, if not all, of the heroes throughout the campaign. Um, and you can kind of swap between them if you'd like. When I started playing, the campaign mode was the only thing available. There wasn't a realm mode at the time, so I did play quite a bit of this campaign mode. Now there's realm mode, which is more like what you expect from roguelites, where you sort of start a randomly generated run, see how far you can go, and then unlock some stuff at the end. This is a better way to, um, 
to to experience the game if you want to try lots of different things the campaign mode is much more forgiving and gives you a better sense of progression you'll have a town in the center that you'll be defending and developing as you rescue people open up the shops and things like that and then you'll go out and sort of cone centric rings around the the city proper as you get further and further out trying to help reestablish order in this city that's been overrun with undead and bandits and things like that so i think for this for this playthrough we'll go ahead and just do a realm mode just so i can get in and get out so we'll do this quick run you can see the play duration could be as little as half an hour if you don't do super well or as much as three hours if if you have a good run and you can go really far i will take it a little bit slow especially at first and sort of describe how the game plays and what's going on but uh, it's pretty quick to pick up so this is a quick and frantic mode that pits you against increasingly unfavorable odds to see how far you can go so let's go ahead and select this one so here is the hero selection screen now you do have the option to go in solo and take a single character i would not recommend doing this for a little while until you understand the game a little bit better that's going to be difficult you do have three slots for heroes so if we go in here, we can take a look at all the different heroes. So first up is Lucius. This is the sword hand. He is a easy complexity character. He has 25 hit points and 13 initiative. The game does use an initiative system that does involve rolling a d20. There are a lot of d20 based role playing game mechanics that are built into this game. As you can see, he has a strength of 13, which gives him a modifier of plus one. If you've played D&D &D or, you know, Pathfinder or many other RPG systems, you'll be familiar with the stat modifier system. He's got a minus one to his intelligence because it's only nine. So when combat starts, there are roles to determine the order of initiative for that round. But the higher your base initiative, the better off you are in terms of going before the monsters. So Lucius is a former soldier who now wanders the realm as a free agent, helping those in need. He is an expert combatant and possesses strong battle instincts, which makes him a natural leader on the field. So you can take a look at his starting deck here. So here's his sword hand deck. So he has these slashes. Let me go over what this means. This one means that it takes one action point. This sword icon indicates that it's going to be a melee attack, which means you can really only attack the things in the front of the lane that you're fighting in um, there's some caveats to that but for the most part melee is close range this deals nine damage and these little uh, pips here along this bar indicate the upgrade level you can upgrade cards like you can in most roguelites and this just means it comes in at base level which you'll see all of his cards are so he has a few slashes he has a keen strike now this does a little bit less damage he gains critical which means his next attack will deal more damage and it's an opener. When played, the AP cost of a non-opener in hand is reduced by one. So you might start with this attack and then it makes something else cheaper and then it also will do more damage. So you can see he is a little bit of a combo user. He you know, wants to apply vulnerable to enemies, give himself some critical and then hit for a big damage. He has some basic guard abilities, which most people will. Now you can see, why does he have a dodge? and a block that both gain five guard, which is basically just a shield against damage. That's because this is a dexterity based guard and this is a strength based guard. Because he is has a higher strength and dexterity than intelligence, he can actually be built either way. And that's what the color of these cards indicates. So this slash is a strength based attack. If I hold control, it will actually show this is actually dealing eight damage plus 100% of your strength mod, and in this case, his strength modifier is one. So it's actually gonna deal eight plus one plus zero from items damage. So that's why it's nine. So, so if we look down here, Keen Strike, which is green, that's because it's dexterity. Now I'm colorblind, so this is this may look different to you if you play without colorblind mode on. I, I'm not 100% sure what looks different, but I think it's it, the pigments is darker here. So you can see this is dealing six damage plus 100% of your dex modifier, which is one. So that's why it does seven damage. And then you gain 10 plus 125% of your dex modifier critical. So it's actually, the reason he gains 11 critical is because he's actually, now wait, it says 10 plus two, but you gain 11. That's odd. It must be rounding up here and then not rounding up here. That's an interesting little thing I've just found there. 
So you can see that any attacks in the game are actually based on your stats. So you can get cards that are based on your strength or your dex or your intelligence and you can build your characters around that. So there are ways to increase your stat points. So Lucius, for instance, we could build him more of a dex character, which would give him more of these kind of critical opening sort of attacks, better dodging, or just strength, which is typically just overwhelming force and damage. Vulnerable here, for instance, or making other characters do more damage, or himself, sorry, um, is a strength-based thing. So I think that's a very interesting thing in this game is that it uses this these stats now it looks complicated when you look at it but it's very easy to just break down you know here's the base here's the modifier here's anything from items you know it's not too bad anytime you see fixed you know for every adjacent ally grant plus one might to self it says plus one fixed might to self because that means there's no way to modify this it doesn't matter how high your strength or dex or intelligence or hit points or initiative or anything is it's just going to be this plus one it's just fixed that way so it's really cool. You do not have to delve into this system and really pay attention to how this is working. You can just use the cards as they say, and that's perfectly fine. You do not need to pay attention to this at all if you don't want to. The only thing you really need to worry about is if I'm using a lot of red cards, I should be increasing my strength. If I'm using a lot of green cards, I should be increasing my dexterity. That's about it. Now, the in interesting thing about these characters are this is his sword hand deck. This is like his basic starting deck. He actually has three other starting decks that kind of give him a different strategy. So you can see, he's, these are the skills he has available to him. And during a run, you can find and upgrade and acquire cards from these different skill sets and mix and match them, or try to just get a lot of one kind. So he has swordsmanship. Uh, swordsmanship skills focus strongly on one-on-one -on -one fighting prowess. Warrior skills focus on general combat ability and crowd control. Leadership skills focus on buffing yourself and allies. So he has a little bit of that in his starting deck already, but you can actually take a look at the cards from that school. So here's swordsmanship. So for instance, a lot of those green um, cards that give him, giving him like critical and stuff that's in here. He has, he has some intelligence modifier things here like this dual card. So you can see what kinds of cards are available, and of course I haven't unlocked them all, for that kind of build, if you want a swordsmanship build. You can actually give him a different starting deck, so we could start with this veteran deck instead. And look here, so it's replaced a couple of the slash cards with these Ren, so now we're applying bleed instead of just basic damage. But he has a higher strength with this start. So you can see the slash is going to be 10 instead of 9 damage, so he's he's more uh, into the strength tree on this one. You can see he's gotten rid of those guards that are dex based and he's got all of these blocks that are strength based which is pretty interesting. We can go duelist and as you might expect there's a lot more green cards in here. Here he's getting thorns so he's retaliating when he gets hit. Here he's getting more of the critical and the opener. Here's ability to shift lanes and then also deal some damage so he's a little bit more mobile and he's got like riposte skills. And then we can take a look at his tactician. Now this is interesting. He's down to 10 strength and 11 dex, giving him no modifiers, but he's up to 14 intelligence. So this is more about being like a general on the battlefield. So you can see he's got intelligence-based abilities here. So he has intelligence-based blocks, which are deflecting. Like he's, he's calculating where his enemy is gonna hit and being prepared to block that. And he, now he has cards like these trigger cards that when an ally in the row attacks, follow up and deal nine damage. And this is retained. So that means if he's in the same row as an ally, and a row in this game, I'll show you how that works. There's rows and lanes. That means if an ally in his row attacks, he'll deal nine damage to that same enemy. But then retain means he'll keep this card. So he could kind of stand next to somebody else who's dealing a lot of attacks, and he can just follow up behind them and do attacks over and over and over and over. So it's a very interesting sort of different way to build him. Now this may seem a little overwhelming and it probably is at first because um, it even, you know, it even changes his starting hit points and initiative, it changes his stats. I mean, there's a lot to pay attention to, but you only need to pay attention to one thing at a time. You know, once I go into the game with the sword hand deck, I can forget that I ever saw any of that stuff and we're just leaping off from right here. So that's Lucius. So next up we have Catherine. Now Catherine is awesome. She's a cleric, but she plays a little bit more like a like a paladin where she 
she brings the hammer and she does the beating and it's really great so her skills are divine focus on channeling the power of the gods to lay waste to your foes so these are quite offensive typically debilitating bolt deal bolt deal some damage make them vulnerable here's some uh, flash bolt we've got dealing a whole bunch of damage as a smite that's a really fun one she has Holy Warrior. These skills focus on combining offensive and defense abilities that are mostly martial in nature. So we have gaining armor, dealing 14 damage and chain forward onto adjacent enemies. Here's a whole bunch of damage that will remove guard. She also has Spirit Healer. Focus on empowering, protecting, and restoring your allies. So it's good to have a character that has some healing um, in your group of three. It's not necessary, but it's certainly helpful. Uh, we just have a little bit of healing here. Heal target for six and purge one, so remove status effects. Here's deal some damage in a line, a holy wave of damage down a whole li a lane of enemies. Here's heal yourself and adjacent allies for three health. So she has a little bit of empowering, um, getting might and critical, dealing a little bit of damage, and a lot of removing status effects and healing. So if we take a look at her starting deck, she has this cleric deck, which has a little bit of everything. You can see we've got some big damage, we've got some guarding. Uh, down here we have reveal. This this card's interesting. You do some damage and then you get a common healing card just once. So every time you use this card, you basically pick a healing card and then you have it in your deck once. So she has a little bit of healing, but you kind of have to work for it when you're playing this way. We can see she has a reverend deck an enforcer deck and a mender deck now this deck is has a lot more healing in it so you've got healing here removing debuffs here's get that heal healing here so much more healing in that deck and you can see she also has different ways to build here she's strength and intelligence with reverend strength and intelligence then Forcer, her strength goes up quite a bit. She's much more about beating things here and with the mender she has incredible intelligence and almost no strength in decks Next up, we have Bertram. He's a ranger. So I won't go into super high detail with the rest of these characters. I just wanted to kind of show how it works a little bit, but we'll go ahead and show him off because I'll probably end up using these three for our first game because they're a little bit easier to understand and kind of show off how the game plays. This is a typical ranger character, but he can be built in a way where he's firing arrows, he's laying traps, or he's summoning like war machines, like automated turrets. So his basic starting deck, I don't think, yeah, he's got the sentry turret in here. You can build him an artillery commander, and then he's got a siege turret, a sentry turret, and some kind of, where is it? There's another one, I guess he doesn't start with it, but it's like um, some kind of blocking turret that like gets in the way of enemies. Bertram is a lot of fun to play, but he does take a little bit of setting up if you're going to use him. This is Alphonse. He's our scoundrel type character. He has lower health, a little bit higher initiative. He has um, a focus on single targets, controlling the battlefield through implements and traps, or sowing chaos with deception and illusion. We have Pierre, the Spellbinder. He's re he was really fun. I've, I've played him and he's quite interesting. He's got uh, elements, so like fire and ice. He has force, which are actually pretty cool. They're, they're, he can control things pretty well. Like he can push enemies around. Um, he can get armor and stuff, which is pretty cool. He's got like the classic like mage armor and like force, almost like a force push. And he can also be built with conjuration to create ethereal objects. So he can make, you know, he just like conjures up a sword and hits, hits people with it. Make a barrier to guard himself. We have Ida, the forest guardian. She's a druid character. She's really quite cool. She has raw fighting power and transformation abilities. She has mastery of the elements of nature, and she has animal kinship on su summoning animals. And she can make things like she can bring out bears. Uh, where is where is that? Here's a spirit wolf, a spirit hawk, a spirit bear. So she can make minions and then sort of buff them up and and keep them healed up. So you have like extra, um, basically NPCs on the board that you don't control, but they they just go about their their day doing whatever they want. You just keep them alive and and healthy. We have Naran the Bard. She's high complexity. I haven't played her yet. She's got very low health. She's a lot more of a control type character. So you can see she's got control the flow of battle, um, hold audiences in rapture. So she's a little bit more complicated to use. 
Kudo the Warlock. I've tried him and I did a terrible job with him, to be honest. Uh, he wants to put make himself bleeding and then he <laughs> uses that to like fuel his own powers. So he manipulates his own blood as a weapon. So he has blood magic. He has uh, debilitate and punish your foes. And he has sour the ground on which your enemies stand. So these are probably... Yeah, pull an enemy into a blood pool. He can put... Uh, yeah, create a blood pool on target cell. Draws Drains HP from the unit on the cell on turn end. So that's pretty interesting. Here's a crimson tide. So is a tidal wave of blood. That's weird. And last but not least, this is the newest character. This is uh, Jendaya. This is the Golemancer. So her focus is on creating uh, Rocky, who is a big golem companion. And then she like tells Rocky to do stuff. So we've got like, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, Rocky charge. Rocky uppercut. <laughs> Rocky finisher. So she commands her golem to do stuff. You can also build her with geomancy to shape earth and clay to defend yourself. Or synthesis, allowing you to draw strength from your golem. So for our first game, I think we'll go ahead and pick just the, the sword hand character, the cleric character, and the ranger character. And I think I'll go ahead and leave them with their with their basic decks. Now, whoops, we gotta switch Catherine back here. Uh, we wanna just have cleric, I think. I think that's fine. Um, and then Bertram. I am tempted to go with the artillery commander deck, but... Uh, yeah, you know what? Let's do it just for fun. It's it's more fun. And then for Lucian or Lucius, I think we're good with his standard sword hand deck. Yeah, I think that'll be fine. Okay. So now we have our team. You can also randomize if you don't want to have to choose. It'll pick three different characters and give them d random like builds, starting builds. Um, and then one more thing we have to look at before we get into a run is this up here. This is Renown, which you get at the end of Acts or Runs in Realm Mode. You spend Renown to discover new artifacts. So artifacts are objects that grant a variety of beneficial effects to your party. So let's take a look at some of the ones I have unlocked. So I have one artifact slot, so when I start a run, I'll be able to bring one artifact in. I can pay to unlock them. I've only found seven of 58 artifacts, but it costs 43 and I only have 42. I'll go ahead and spend one here to unlock the next slot. I think it's 100 for the next one. Wow. So these are the artifacts I have unlocked. So four leaf clover, start a run with plus two fate, and you gain one fate upon completing deadly encounters on the map, which is a locked ability. We do have to upgrade this. So you can see it takes 515 Renown to upgrade this, or we can get rid of it if we don't want it. So this means that we start the game with plus two fate, and fate is basically rerolls. So when you're doing non-combat encounters and you have like a character who's trying to sneak past enemies and they fail and you have a fate point, you can you can try that again. You can also start with the Dodecahedron, which is pretty funny. It's rolling 20 on the dice in an event challenge grants one fate. So, you know, anytime you get a, basically a critical success, you also get a fate point for later use. We have the Tinkerer's Instruments. Salvaging rare items produces an additional rare crystal. So if you take apart rare items, you can get uh, more components. We have a Salamander's Eye. Heroes have plus one fire resist. Anti-Magic Pendant. Pierre gains access to field ability Nullify. Now, we're not using Pierre in this run, but that's interesting that there are character-specific artifacts there's a holy symbol increases Catherine's base stats by one that's probably one we could end up using isn't it and then we have the jeweler's loop rolling sockets requires two less common parts so that that's basically saying it takes less resources to change some of the modifiers on your items so we can head back and then we can move on to the next screen we can just pick our our difficulty here let's just go ahead and do normal i guess for this one and then we can, so it says entering Maelstrom Gate. Now we have Hidden Empire, and this will give us some extra renown here. Nodes have a chance to contain germination effects. Enemies resist physical damage. Twilight Province. Curse, curses inflicted on the party last twice as long. Party has minus three physical resist. Dark Valley. Curses inflicted on the party last twice as long. Routes have a higher chance of containing curses. Uh, that's interesting. Curses last twice as long. Let's go with the hard one. So here we are at the beginning of our run. So 
like a lot of roguelites, we have this sort of map and we get to plan our route through here to the final boss, which is down here. It looks like we have, what is this? Some kind of spider boss. Okay, it looks kind of terrifying. Spider matron, spider leaper, and a spiderling. This is level nine. So we're level one right now. So we need to make sure we get, you know, a pretty good amount of resources going, going through here. So we can take a look at all the different nodes that we have kind of plan our route. So here's a, like a... a uh, deadly encounter so we get extra XP but the party is cursed with five and feeble um, here we have a regular fight with some dire wolves we have a regular fight with some spiderlings and over here we have a merchant chance a chance to purchase items and resources to keep the expedition going now we have our starting gold so I'm probably not gonna bother with that right there are other little halfway point nodes which are interesting like here's a little plus a hundred gold if we go this route Here's some random curse if we go this route. Here's some gold. So we can try to plot a course around these curses if possible, but it looks like it's possible. We don't have a lot of control over our route if we end up going that way. Ooh, blessing, okay. Um, and then up here, so let's take a look at the UI really quickly. We have recenter on party if we lose track of where we are. We can set up a camp and that uses supplies. We won't do that right now because we don't need to, but I will show you eventually how the camping works. We can also click on each of our characters here and take a look at their uh, stats and all that stuff. So characters have, you can see their deck here. We can take a look at equipment. So here's like a small health file that we have. Now this is a one-time use item, not once per battle, but actually one time in total. So this is a consumable. So this is something we might put on somebody like Lucian. Oh, actually, he starts with one on. So let's put that on him. We can also use it now if we need to. We have our resources. So we have our supplies, our gold, and our fate. And we have our synergy. So this is like our relationship bonuses with people. Um, this is pretty complicated. We'll, we'll go into this a little bit later, I think. And so equipment, uh, which we don't have any to start with. Equipment actually can add cards to your deck. Uh, which is really really cool and they can have slots and you can put like gems in them and stuff like that it's there there's a lot of stuff going on here we also have like here's his stat block you know we have his max fury his agility his channel charges so these are things used by certain types of cards his resistances to damage hand draw cards retained per turn max number of summons he can have out his action points his health uh, here is your special cards. So this is uh, SP for special. So he's got 0 out of 3, 14 initiative, and no exhaustion. Exhaustion is acquired as you play, and they kind of clog up your, your hand and deck with these exhaustion cards that are hard to get rid of. And you have to rest to get rid of them. Up here we have the menu, the help. Here's our money, which we can use for you know making trades. Supplies are used when we when we pass through nodes like it'll say here it uses one supply uses two supplies to go here so we have to make sure we don't run out of supplies we also need those for camping fate is our re-rolling for challenge rolls and then renown is that resource that we carry on in between runs to make this game a roguelite so we can get upgrades and stuff like that over here we have our journal so we have our main quest which is we're just venturing into the depths of the infinite realms and trying to beat the bosses we have no completed quests and just all quests here. Here we have our skill grid. Now, this is yet another system that we have um, to manage. So let's just take a look at Lucy. And so when, when we level up, we'll get skill points. And we start here in the center. We can kind of fan out from there wherever we want. So here he gains extra max health. Here he we can increase a card's base values by increasing his skill rank, like his, his strength or something. Uh, you know, initiative learn a skill from a school of your choice or gain a respect point so you can kind of like go out from here and then as you fill up this box you'll actually get so it says spend four more skill points to unlock your next skill grid so then this is a skill grid here so we'll actually get another block of skills that we can attach somewhere like we kind of build it almost like a jigsaw puzzle and then we can continue on in that direction and then we can even put another one and another one or whatever you want to do so it's it's an interesting system. Uh, it's just, I just, I'm not sure if there's too many systems in this game to manage. We can go to our heroes. We saw that by clicking on their cards and we can go back to the map from here. 
All right, everyone, I think that's going to do it for our episode zero here. I think next episode we'll probably hit one of these combats so we can actually take a look at how the game actually plays once we're in, and we'll start making our way down to the boss from there. So thank you, everybody, so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those below. Please consider liking it, subscribing, and I will see everybody in episode one.